you're about to start a new project. You can either go with Blazor WebAssembly, that flashy new technology you've heard so much about, or go with something more mature, like Angular. Which one should you pick? In this episode, I'll help you decide. Hey, welcome to episode 32 of Code Hour. Nice round number. In this episode, I'm going to talk about Blazor WebAssembly versus Angular. I'm going to compare and contrast them. It's going to be a client side shootout. And this is going to be a slightly unusual presentation because it's going to be different from the ones that I normally do, which are 60 minutes worth of live coding condensed down into 30 minutes. Instead, this is a full presentation. It's a 60 minute presentation, which I've prepared for a user group or for a conference. And I'm giving it to uh, you all, YouTube audience for tonight. So without further ado, Blazor WebAssembly versus Angular client side shootout. First of all, my name is Lee Richardson. In case you don't know by now, writer, speaker, YouTuber on .NET and open source topics and I'm also an author of The Siren of Shame. I work at a great company, Inferno Red Technology. And I am on Twitter and YouTube, obviously. I blog at LeeRichardson.com. I'm on LinkedIn. But more importantly, let's talk about Blazor WebAssembly. So this is a technology from Microsoft that was relatively recently released. And I got really excited about it about a year ago. And I was looking for an excuse to use it. And simultaneously, my daughter is learning how to type. So I thought, well, how about I take this desire to learn a new technology and try to solve this problem by writing a game. So the game I wrote is called Typer Shark, and it's actually live right now at typershark.io. And if you go to typershark.io right now, there it is. So you can play single player or multiplayer. The idea that I had here was the single player is just like for practice, but what it's really about is collaborative typer sharking. <laughs> so the sharks come through and you know one person or multiple people take take the top, some someone takes the middle and someone takes the bottom. So it looks kind of like this. I say, well, let's do single player first. So we're gonna start the game, and as you can see, the sharks fly across and um, random words and eventually you fail and I scored seven points by killing seven sharks the actual game that I played and that I based this on which was a long time ago my wife and I used to like to compete and would compete on who could type the faster and this game called Typer Shark which this is a sort of a modern re envisioning of had uh, multiple levels and you go further down and you could you know, blast mines stuff like that it was a, it was more sophisticated um, I'm not a gamer I, I'm not a game writer this is the first game I've ever written but I think it turned out relatively well I'm proud of it and so that's what this presentation is all going to be about by the way I did a presentation I did a code hour two episodes ago it was an intro to blazer web assembly and that's kind of a corollary it's a it builds on this kind of builds on that they're independent they they support each other so that is typer shark oh and i also wrote a blog post about it i published it up to code project and so this episode is based on that article worth checking out was well received so what is blazer or as i was preparing this presentation my daughter walked in the room and she's like dad what is Blazor? So, you know, there's only one good, as a dad, there's really only one good answer to that. Well, he was the bad guy in The Hobbit, right? Blazor the Defiler. No, Blazor is actually a technology that allows you to build web applications in C Sharp. And it was released relatively recently. It's a very new technology. So there's two different flavors of it, which I'll talk about in a second. The the first version of it, which I'll not really be covering as much now, is the Blazor server, which came out with .NET Core 3 in September of 2019. Blazor WebAssembly, which is what this presentation is on, was only released uh, four, four months ago. So it's very hot, very new technology. By comparison, I'm going to be comparing it to Angular. 
And AngularJS, the original AngularJS was written in 2012, like eight years ago, and Angular 2 was released in 2016, so it's four years old now, and Angular 10 was just released, and that was uh, just a couple months ago. So, I mean, right, right now you can see when you're comparing these two that the Blazor is very new and the Angular is very old, so it's almost kind of unfair to compare these two technologies. But, I mean, this is like the Wild West, right? It doesn't matter who's the, the new kid on the block and who's been around, it's all about who's got the fastest draw. So, the server-side versus client-side, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So this is a diagram of server-side Blazor, and it looks like this. On the server-side, you have C-sharp running, and it's, it creates the DOM. So it's the, all the buttons and all the elements in the browser, and it renders that all out, and then sends that whole DOM as a render tree down through SignalR to the UI thread in the browser. Then the browser accepts that, it updates the DOM, and then it can listen for events. And if it receives event like a button click, then it can send that back and it goes back up to the server side. Then that runs some more C sharp potentially. It figures out what the diff is and it's, it's only calculating the diff and it sends the diff back down to the UI thread which then up, updates just the DOM that's changed. And so it's fairly efficient. It doesn't need to update everything. It's kind of like update panels used to be in, in uh, back a long time ago, if you remember web forms. So by comparison, the client side blazer is running entirely in the browser, but you'll notice that these diagrams look very, very similar. The only difference is that this C sharp bar here is now running in the browser. There's still a render tree that's sent down. It updates the DOM, event diffs are going back. And so the two styles of coding are nearly identical. The only difference is a little bit of difference in the setup, the way you set them up. However, I will say that architecturally, server-side Blazor and client-side Blazor are very different. And when I originally wrote the Typer Shark, I wrote it in server-side Blazor, and I had to rewrite it in client-side Blazor. And because the architectures are so different, it actually ended up being a major rewrite. So if you're considering starting a new project, do think very carefully about which one, and don't plan on just swapping one technology out with the other. A little tip for you there. So client side versus server side features. When I give presentations, I always like to do interactivity and ask the audience. So I'll do that here, but just without waiting. So go ahead and pause the video when I, uh, when I get to this. So which one do you think is gonna have the better file size, the server side or the client side? The answer is the, and when I'm talking about file side, I'm talking about the initial file load. So what you're downloading from the server. Well, obviously you're gonna have a better file size with the server side. And that's because with the client side, you have to download the whole .NET framework. That's a big download. So you end up downloading a lot of stuff. Now, which one gives you offline support? It should be obvious, client side does. Which one gives you better scalability? Well, if you're 100% offline, you can have better scalability. And a further note on that, and that is, Part of the problem with scalability when you're in server-side mode is that you have the server has to keep connections open to every single client that's connecting to it. And it has to also keep the DOM. It has to keep a, in memory a version of the DOM for all of the clients that are connecting to it. Now, Microsoft claims that scalability is still great with server-side, and maybe it is, but um, it's definitely not an issue when you're running client-side. API size is better server side. Now when I'm talking about API size, what I mean is do you get to access more of the .NET framework? You get to access more of it in server side because you can do things like connecting to a database. Because when you're running C Sharp in the client side, and I'm going to get into how that works a little bit later, you're not getting, you're still sandboxed. You're still sandboxed by what the browser can do. Right, so this is not Silverlight. Silverlight was running in an external process and it had much more control over what it can do. But you can't do things like accessing the uh, file store or connecting to a database. So you can't get Entity Framework. But when you're running server-side Blazor, you can do all of those things. Which one's gonna have a better debugging experience? Well, 
the problem with the client side is it's a lot more complex to compile C Sharp down into WebAssembly and then be able to debug it. So, and I'll get into that, how that works later. Browser support is going to be better on the server side, actually. And the reason for that is that um, client side requires WebAssembly and WebAssembly is not available on all browsers. It's available on modern browsers, but it's not available on IE. However, IE is supported by server side. So that's a requirement for you. That could make a difference. Well, the whole point of this presentation is to compare Blazor with Angular. So let's start talking about Angular. Is it going to have a good file size? Yeah, absolutely. It's going to have a great file size. It's going to be like the server side because it doesn't need to worry about downloading the .NET framework. Obviously, it's got offline support. You don't need to connect back to a database. It's scalability. It's going to be great, just like the client side. How about that API size? Yeah, kind of a weird question, right? I mean, you don't, you can't connect databases, so I guess it's not good. But I don't know. It's kind of weird to even compare it because it's JavaScript. And in fact, much later in the presentation, I'm going to dig into this topic in more detail. The debugging experience, I think it's pretty good in Angular. I think it's actually better probably in server-side Blazor than it is in Angular, but it's good. Browser support in Angular, it's great. It supports IE, so, and all the modern browsers, it's good. All right, so we've talked about WebAssembly. What exactly is it? Yes, what is it? It's a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. Like, duh. <laughs> but what does that mean? Well, if you have, here's a little diagram showing the server and a browser. If you've got a traditional JavaScript file which is living on the server, then the browser goes and requests it. It parses it. It compiles it. It converts it into bytecode. And then there's a JIT compiler, and that JIT compiler only converts that bytecode to native code on an as-needed basis. So it will figure out where it does not need to do that, and so that's how modern browsers get their performance, is this JIT and native code step. I didn't know that, but I, I learned that in pre preparation for this presentation. And actually, this book, Microsoft, I've got a reference to it here, Microsoft. Ugh. Microsoft uh, Blazor. Microsoft Blazor, Building Web Applications in .NET, second edition by Peter Hemshoot is a good book. I borrowed this diagram from him. And so similarly, if you have a WebAssembly file, it could be in any language. It could write it in C or C++ or Java. And then it gets compiled, that happens on the server side, and gets turned into a .wasm file which is basically a whole bunch of binary instructions that looks like assembly, actually. And then that .wasm file is what gets sent down to the browser. And then you bypass the whole parser, compiler, bytecode step, and instead it's going straight into the JIT compiler to native code. So WebAssembly gets to bypass that whole section of the regular JavaScript file pipeline. So what does it look like? This is a C file, and I borrowed this from an article from Jeremy Likeness. I got the reference down there in the bottom, an InfoQ article. And he shows a C file, which is doing a search throughout a string to see if that character exists in the string. And this, on the right-hand side, is what it gets converted to in WebAssembly, and that's what the binary instruction looks like, the instructions converted back into something that looks like assembly. And you'll see that it looks an awful lot like assembly. If you uh, took that course back in college a long time ago, or you are interested in this kind of stuff and read books on it, but you know, you're loading things into registers, and it's comparing registers, and adding and jumping, and stuff like that. And if you take a look at a, well, I'm going to look at my TyperShark application, but if you take a look at that, you'll see that there is a .NET.WASM. And that's binary, for sure, but hang on a second. That .WASM file, I guess, what are all those DLLs doing in there? I was expecting a whole bunch of WASM files, like everything gets converted into WebAssembly, right? 
Yeah, that's not actually how it works, it turns out. Instead, the way that Blazor has implemented it is there is a core WASM like bootstrapper, basically. And here in this article from Rick Strahl, he's got a great diagram where he explains all this. And that mono, well, it's not mono.wasm, it's now called .net.wasm. This is an older article. It is loading these DLLs, which are in .NET standard, and it has the ability to load those files up and then run them. So I think that the consequence is the performance is not quite as good when it's using this technique. The effect when you're a developer is you don't even notice this is happening. But this is how it actually works. And I believe that there are plans, he mentions in this article, that there are plans to convert C Sharp eventually directly into WASM. But for right now, it's just running as MSIL. So that's kind of interesting. Details you don't really need to know, but I find that kind of stuff really interesting. So benefits, obviously, the number one benefit, goodbye JavaScript, hello any other language. Uh, you know, I don't hate JavaScript. I used to really hate it. It's kind of grown on me. I've gotten used to it, but boy, it would be wonderful to switch to any other language, right? Um, it's also faster than JavaScript. It's supposedly got near native performance. Blazor does anyway. I don't know if Web uh, Blazor or sorry WebAssembly does. I don't know if Blazor necessarily does. And when I say native, I mean like C or C++ native, not like JavaScript native. It's also orders of magnitude faster start up than time than ASM.js. ASM.js was an article that Jeremy Likeness, I think it was, was describing that this used to be based off of. It was a technology that allowed you to compile C and C++ down into a JavaScript version of assembly. It's uh, faster than that, so that's really cool. And there's actually more instructions available to you than in the JavaScript language. So that's part of the another part of the reason that it's faster. All right, Blazor features. So Blazor is a technology that sits on top of WebAssembly, right? And it gives you a whole bunch of features that are in addition to just compiling a language down into um, bytecode that can be read by the browser. So I'll get into all of these. This is this is that like the stereotypical. It's the thing that everybody always shows when they're showing Blazor. And actually, if you do File New Project, this is what you get to. It's just like a counter, and you click a button, and the button goes up, and you're like, oh, <laughs> real exciting, right? But uh, it's worth taking a look at it because it does a lot of different stuff. So first of all, I forgot to mention it, but Razor is a combining of the words browser and Razor. And Razor syntax is one of the benefits that you get. And it's this kind of it's kind of pleasant hybrid of HTML and C sharp. So it gives you data binding. This is showing one way data binding where the current count is bound into the current count down here. And so when you click the button here on click, it goes down to increment count, which increments this count, which increments this. And because of the data binding, then this automatically gets updated. So it'll be current count one, two, three, four. There's also two way data binding. There is routing, and you can have parameters in your routes. There is access to the full .NET framework. Yay, we love the .NET framework. I do anyway. It's got dependency injection built in as a first class citizen throughout everywhere. Love that. And it's got components. So this is a couple of components here. And um, you know the ability to compose a large application into a bunch of components is a critical piece of any modern application framework on JavaScript. It also has interop, so you can compile, you can run, you can call code from JavaScript, you can call into C sharp. And in fact, that's what I had to do for the typer shark because when as you know, you're typing buttons and knocking down sharks, it has to take your keystrokes and there's no native Blazor event for key handle, at least not currently. And so the code to do that looks like this. You're doing a document dot on key press. Um, well, that's just defining an event, but then you can call dot net, which is an object on the global scope 
that Blazor adds, and then you can call invoke method async on it. You pass in the name of the DLL that you're calling, and then you expose something, which in this case is a method called JS keypress. You expose that method, and then you can you can call it and call an event on it. Similarly, you can call from C Sharp into JavaScript. If you inject, again, here's your dependency injection, an IJS runtime, then you can call JS runtime dot invoke async, and you can call any method on it, like alert hi, and this will pop up in a little alert. And by the way, this comes from uh, Thomas Claudier Huber Pluralsight course. I recommend this Pluralsight course if you're interested in the interop. It goes into a lot more detail. And you also get layouts. So this is the section of the application here. Bethany's Pie Shop, by the way, is a, a application that Gil Clarine builds up in the Pluralsight course, getting started with Blazor. And this is the section of the application that never changes. And then as the routing, as you navigate around in the app, this section here changes. So that's routing. Oh, and then you get access to NuGet. Yay! That's cool. You can pretty much pull down anything that you can get in NuGet. You can pull it down and run it in the browser, as long as it doesn't violate the security constraints. So that's really cool, like doing file access or whatever. All right, that's what is Blazor. Let's do a component demo. This demo is going to be kind of like the one that I did in the episode two episodes ago, intro to Blazor, but um, it's going to be a little different. So first of all, if I control F5 this, start without debugging, here we go. And if we're playing the multiplayer version of it, then it's going to ask, what's your name? And sure, my daughter's name is Emma, OK. There's no games created. Would you like to create a game? Sure. Create a game. And somebody else can now join this game. So how does this look? There is a, this project here is the client. There's, well, there's four different, there's tests. I'll get into those later. There's the server component, which is an ASP.NET core application. You don't need this, but I, I use it for when you're playing multiplayer, because when you're playing multiplayer, obviously you have to have a shared state that everybody is connecting to. So that's the, the server. The shared is a, a shared library that both the server and the client can use. And then the client is the WebAssembly. And there is an index.html here. If I take a look inside of dub root index.html, there it is. and there's a CSS file. I mean, this looks like a regular HTML file, except it is calling into blazor.webassembly.js, which is loading all of the components for WebAssembly. And I believe that's probably where it loads the .net.wasm file, and then starts pulling down all your DLLs, including the typeershark2.client DLL. OK, but more importantly, where does it end up? It ends up at index.cs and index.razor. And index.razor says, OK, if multiplayer has not been defined, then give the user the option of single player or multiplayer. If multiplayer is true, which we set when someone clicks select multiplayer, then we're showing all this code. And that's just, it's messy. And you know, the further this component goes, the longer this is going to get. So this would be a really nice thing to take this section of code right here and plunk that out into its own component. So let's do that now. Actually, first of all, do you want to do you, do you trust me that's what's really happening? Let's see. What's your name? Let's make a couple changes to it. If I hit save and refresh, here we go. All right, let's hunt sharks together. There we go. We've got some exclamations. That, that's really the real thing. So let's plunk that out into a folder called components. Now, behind the scenes, the components and pages are actually kind of the same thing. They just the difference about whether they have a route or not, which is true in Angular, too. All right. And what is this going to be called? We'll call this the name component. I don't know what's idiomatic yet in Blazor, but I'm following the Angular conventions of putting the word component after it. Oh, and actually, I messed up, but bear with me. I meant to add the razor file. 
Okay, and when I add this, what it does is it puts a code block in here. And so I can define a method. And that's where my C sharp should go. But I don't like that. I like a I like having a clear delineation between my view and the code behind the the sort of controller. And so if you know how this is working, you can separate them off. And to do that, you just need to know that the player name component dot razor is actually getting compiled down into it takes the name of this file and makes a class for it, which it puts in the obj directory. So there's a player name component dot cs class. And so if I name this thing the exact same thing, player name component, and put it in the same folder so it's violating the namespace, it's going to say, hey, there's already a duplicate definition. Well, that's great actually. If I make that partial, then now I can have my code behind here and I can put this do the thing or you know whatever over there. Okay, let's see if we can't get this player name component to show up. It would be nice if IntelliSense had worked there, but if I run this now. No, oh, it didn't complain. <laughs> well, all right, well, it, what it needs is, the reason it's not working is it needs a using clause. So I could put an at using up here, or better, I could just say I would like to always import anything in the component's namespace. And to do that, there's an imports.razor over here, and so I can... Okay, hey, look at that. The red squiggles went away. That's good to see. And if I refresh this, hopefully we'll see that component show up. Oh, yeah, there it is, player name component. Awesome. And so now we want to take all of, well, I guess we want to take all of that, don't we? Okay, and it wants our temp player, so I guess we can move that over. Oh, it wants a set name, we can bring that over. Oh, well, we need to be able to, once they click the button to set the name, then we need to set that on the context. What is the context? That's just an object that I defined that is over here. I made it up myself, and it's going to hold state. It's a singleton. How do you know it's a singleton? That's because over in program.cs, I set up the dependency injection to say, add a singleton. Anytime you see an iGame context, I want you to create a game context and only have one of them throughout the entire application. So we'll need to take that code and plunk that over into the player name component. Oh, and set name is uh, up there. How about that? Oh, that's better. Oh, it looks, it looks good. Do you think it's going to work if I compile now? It says it worked. All right, put in a name. Okay. And it's not doing anything. And the reason it's not doing anything is because we have set the player and the context.player got set there and back in index we were looking at context.player to see if it is uh, not equal to null. If it's not equal to null then it's listing the games. But the problem is that happened in a subcomponent and subcomponents won't update their parents. They maintain state independently. It's part of Blazor's performance. So we need to create a new event inside of the player name component to call back up to the parent. So I'm just going to show you how to do parameters real quick. Unfortunately, these have to be generic. Good, and we probably need to actually do something. And what should we do here? We should probably do something which is notifying Blazor that the components changed. And I had to do this occasionally when I was doing interop inside of the Typer Shark because if I made changes to the sharks and things like that and I made them in JavaScript and I sent them back in, then Blazor wouldn't know that it needed to go re-render the DOM and update the DOM. So to do that, you oh yeah, you call state has changed. 
And let's see if this works. Oh, hey, it worked. Fantastic. And so that's really all there was to it. We've now created a subcomponent. We've created a parameter that's a callback. And then you can see kind of how that works. And we learned a little bit about state has changed. Interestingly enough, if I were to comment that out, you would find that this still works. And the reason is because just seeing that there was an event was enough for the parent component to know that it needed to do that. So that's kind of interesting. Here we go. Awesome. Let's continue on with the presentation. In fact, it's time for the shootout. So I'm going to look over 10 separate areas comparing Blazor WebAssembly to Angular. And I do a lot of Angular in my day job. So uh, as you probably know, if you are a regular subscriber to this channel. So let's talk about view typing. And when I say view typing, this is a razor component. And take a look inside of um, bind-value to templayer.name. What would happen in the IDE if I were to mistype that? The answer is, in Blazor, well, first of all, I guess I should say, what does this do? <laughs> What does this do? The answer is, this is an edit form. It's like a form with an input type equals text, except these are weird components. They're slightly weird because they are Blazor versions of what you're used to in HTML. And so they're actually strongly typed versions of HTML. And you'll see that this model right here says that for this edit form, the thing that I'm going to be editing whenever I make changes is the temp player. And so when I'm binding it to the temp player dot name, the IntelliSense can take over. And what does that look like? That looks like this. What's your name? And if I were to mistype something like, oh yeah, validation message for temp player dot NAM, it turns it red right in the ID immediately before you even compile and get the compiler errors. So that's a great example of typing. It's a great example of IntelliSense. And I just, I love view typing in Razor. It is a wonderful feature. By contrast, if you're in Angular world, this is the same component basically in Angular. And uh, if you're an Angular person watching this, you might say, oh, but you should create it in a separate file. You should do a template URL. Yeah, sure. But ultimately, this is the same thing and, and this is the way it actually renders and if you type ng model player name and you mistype player name here and you maybe change it over here in the code behind it's not gonna there's not gonna be a compiler error that tells you that in angular ever and so that is a huge win for blazor right off the bat in fact this is what you're gonna get in angular if you mistype something in the view so blazor wins for view typing. How about component level CSS? What do I mean when I say that? Take a look at that form a little bit closer that I showed you in Angular. This has something called style URLs and it's pointing to an SCSS. It's pointing to a SAS file. I love this about Angular and once I discovered this in Angular 2 and through 10 and beyond, uh, it just made life so much easier because before then there used to be these massive CSS files that would, you know, you would end up putting something in there that only applied to a tiny little section of the site. But once you get components and component level CSS, things just, the CSS is just modular with your components and it makes everything so tidy and nice and wonderful. And I love this about Angular. So this is a big win for Angular. There's nothing like this yet in Blazor. Rumor is that it's coming down the pipe soon and that we will see component level CSS in Blazor WebAssembly, but it's not there yet. So I give Angular the win on that one. Now let's take a look into validation, form validation for a little bit. So I showed you the edit form and I showed this code, but I just glossed over it. So there's a data annotations validator and then a validation summary. And if I have an input type equals text bind value temp player name and I don't put in the name and this is what actually happened in the site, then it says the name field is required. It's like, oh, that's cool. But where did that error message came, come from? It came from the data annotations validator, which then looked at the model and saw that there's a required attribute. 
And it also noticed, by the way, that there's a string length attribute. It has to be less than 50 characters. And it tells you what the error message is. And it gives you a nice display name. All of these things, when they live on your models, I just find that so tidy. It's just such a really pleasant way of doing validation. I'm a big, big fan. By comparison, if you do template driven, well, you, in, in Angular, you've got two choices. You can do template driven, or you can do forms driven. And the this is an example of forms driven where you do, this was a, a page that I wrote for having passwords. You got two passwords, a password one and a password two, and you, they need to be equal. And they also have to have a regex pattern. And this is the code that I ended up writing in it. It works, but it's just not, it's not beautiful. I don't love it. It's powerful. You can really do a lot once you're doing this type of validation. You can have different sections and you can do a lot but it's not great. Oh, and I forgot to mention, but so, okay, so Blazor, I totally give Blazor the win on validation just because that default level of validation is so pretty. And you can also validate, just type in arbitrary C sharp and you can just put in C sharp that says um, on form validation, call this code. And if it, you know, call it to a, you know, another web service or something to make sure that an address is valid, you can do that in C sharp. And so that's really nice. I'll give Blazor the win on that one. All right, two for Blazor, one for Angular. Let's talk about tooling. If you've done much Angular, you've probably done an ng generate component, my new component, and it creates an HTML, and it creates a TypeScript, and it creates a CSS file, and it creates a test for you. All of those things, boom, right there, hooks everything up, just makes it work. When I was doing that demo earlier and I was showing how to create a component. I had to create a .razor file and then create a .cs file. I certainly didn't create a, um, a unit, it didn't create a unit test for me. The tooling was just, eh, not so great. I, I don't always love the command line, but this is a great command line experience and I love that about Angular. Um, this was one of the rare examples of IntelliSense working correctly for me. I found that eh, it was about 50-50 that the Visual Studio tooling would work correctly and the IntelliSense would work correctly. And sometimes it just, you'd just be typing stuff and it would have to figure out and it wouldn't work. So that was a frustration for me. So what's this? This is the Angular Constant Runner thing. <laughs> the Constant Runner thing. That's a, that's a technical term. It's the Angular live development server, which is running and watching all of your code, and it determines which files changed and compiles just the files that changed and sends them. So you get that super fast feedback loop. You'll notice in the demo that I actually never hit F5, and I didn't do that because it's so painfully slow. If you hit Control F5 and start without debugging, you get an almost as fast experience as this, but Angular is just built to do it. Angular is built to do the watching and constantly reloading. And so the development loop I found was very, very fast in Angular. So all of these things combined. Um, oh, oh, and here's another one. So sometimes I found uh, that I would be typing stuff in Blazor and then I'd end up here. This is the player name component dot razor dot g dot CS, and this is the file which lives inside of the obj directory, and it's ugly, it's absolutely terrible, and when you end up in this place, you're just like, whoa, what happened? Why am I here? What's going on? And um, it's just, it's probably going to get fixed, but it's just another example of the tooling kind of failing. And, and this kind of happens when you have typos in your blade, in your razor files. So Angular gets the win for tooling. Maturity, I kind of already talked about this, but uh, just saying another word or two about this. When you find yourself on an odd edge of a framework and you're trying to do something that no one else has ever done before and you go out or maybe not very many people have done it before and you go out and you search on Stack Overflow or whatever and you find someone else that's found it and they've solved the problem and you're like yes or there's some component that you can download that exists out there because there's a huge 
like enormous community of people that are actively working and maintaining and contributing back and there's a huge source of knowledge that all is worth a lot so I just have to specifically point that out angular absolutely gets the win when it comes to maturity as far as the language what are you doing I just thought of a bad opinion someone could have and now I'm searching to see if anyone does so I can be mad at them sounds like you have a healthy relationship with the internet hey at least I'm not this guy I just found well, I guess this guy would be me. Um, this is a controversial section, but yeah. Most loved, dreaded, and wanted language. C-sharp rated number 10th. That seems really low to me. JavaScript was only one lower, and TypeScript is up there at three. What is going on? Obviously, everyone who filled out the survey is an idiot, <laughs> right? C-sharp is a wonderful language. I love C-sharp so much. It just keeps getting better, too. It's got all of these wonderful functional features, and link is like the best thing ever, and syntax trees, the uh, ability to convert arbitrary C-sharp into an abstract syntax tree and then parse it and do stuff with it is what enables link. That's a language feature that exists like no other languages. C-sharp is just wonderful absolutely love it so blazer wins right yeah okay I mean I could just go ahead and give blazer the win but I, one more thing on that and that is here's some angular code All right, this is idiomatic angular so this says go call into the user service and regardless of whether it succeeds or fails I want you to call this finish callback and then I want you to subscribe I guess this is saying like okay if it's successful or fails well okay I guess if it's if it succeeds then I want to take the users that are resulted and update the users with it and then I want to call show paging um, and by the way if there was an error then I want you to console.log HTTP error this is rxjs and rxjs has places where it's nice but it doesn't need to be everywhere and I just find this really hard to read by comparison, if you rewrite this in Blazor, it looks like this. Oh, isn't that just wonderful? Like, that is how code is supposed to be. Try, catch, finally, await. Um, I just, I love that. I think it's just really elegant. And so Blazor absolutely gets the win, hands down, without any question. Debugging. The debugging experience, I've mentioned this, but it's it's not great in Blazor. And so, for instance, what would you expect to happen here? Imagine uh, it's got what your name, I'm going to hit the McKay button, and McKay is set up to set name. So set name is going to do a console.write line of 5 divided by get 0, and get 0 is returning 0, so, oh, we've got to divide by 0 error, right? Oh, but we have this wonderful thing, exception settings turned on in Visual Studio, where we're catching all CLR exceptions. So you would expect, I would expect, that the debugger would immediately jump right here into line 25, and what actually happens? Wah, wah, wah. It does not do that at all. It gives you a runtime error. It says an unhandled error has occurred, reload, and it gives you this. And that's what you always get. That's always the... Uh, what happens when you get runtime errors in, in Blazor. So you end up having to copy this. If you're lucky, you've got ReSharper installed and then the Stack Trace Explorer. If you've copied this and gone over here, the Stack Trace Explorer pops up and you can navigate through it and find out where in your code the error actually occurred. Uh, it's so much better in any other C Sharp world. Um, and I think this is a work in progress. It's going to get better. But this is the way it is right now and I, I don't love that experience. So. Angular gets the win. Angular debugging is still not great, but it's better than that anyway. Testability, just a quick word on this, and that is uh, I love testing. I generally a TDD fan. I don't do it at TDD 100% of the time, but I do frequently. If I write a regex, for instance, I go write all my tests first. Um, different types of code warrant writing tests first, and I'm just constantly going back and forth in and out of tests and production code. So it means a lot to me that Blazor is very, very friendly to unit testing. If you have been 
doing unit testing in the past and you're scared of the type of code that Microsoft writes, don't be. They did a lovely job with it. It's really good. And you know, testability is a first class citizen in Angular. So we get testability in both in great and that's wonderful. Makes me very happy. Lastly, the interop story. This is a little bit complicated because, well, okay, if you have a Angular component, then you can get to all of NPM. And if you have a Blazor component, then you can get to all of NuGet. Now, can Angular get to NuGet? No, of course not, right? Angular can't get to NuGet code. That doesn't even make sense. How about Blazor? Can Blazor get to NPM? Yeah, sure. Actually, um, I showed some examples. It's not as easy as you might hope it would be, but it's possible. You can do any kind of interop with any kind of JavaScript. So you might look at this and say, oh, Lee's going to give Blazor the win because Blazor can get to all code and Angular can only get to NPM code. But this diagram lies a little bit. It's a bit misleading because it doesn't take into account two things. One, the likelihood that you're going to want to get to one of these two different sources and two, the difficulty in getting to these two different sources. So it seems like it would be wise to put in to color code, not just green and red, but maybe to put in a yellow to indicate that something is hard, but not impossible, and to maybe do the width of the lines to indicate how likely it is that you would want to get somewhere. So I think this is a better diagram. This says, if you're in Blazor, you can get to NuGet and that's a pretty common thing to do if you're in Blazor world. You're also pretty likely to need to get to NPM, and it's hard to do. It's really a pain in the butt. And if you do a lot of it, you're going to have to write a lot of boilerplate code to make that work. By comparison, Angular is going to NPM all the time, and it's super easy to do, but it can't get to NuGet, but nobody ever needs to. Nobody, I, I guarantee you, there's nobody in the Angular community that's like, oh, gosh, if I could only get to NuGet. So it's a complex topic, and I guess I'd give the win to Angular because it is so hard to get into JavaScript from Blazor, but it depends on your project, it depends on what you're doing, so it's a tricky one. Okay, the last one, I gotta get into code sharing because I, I think this is a, a cool topic. This was the this was the Typer Shark uh, application that I wrote. And so it has a game engine. And this game engine keeps track of sharks. You've got a whole bunch of sharks swimming around. It's keeping track of how long until each one of them is killed and which what the word is in it and how many letters have been typed. And if you've got multiple players, it's also keeping track of who's typed which letters so that you know if, if you have two people typing the same word, um, it, it takes care of all of that. So it's not super complicated, but it's a little bit complicated. And it also is something which needs to be run by both the client side and here's an example of it being run on the client side so you have a game component which has a game engine adapter a single player game engine adapter so if you click single player it instantiates one of these guys and then the game engine sends events back and those events happen in memory and so this in the single player world this game engine and all of its related code exists and compiles down into the browser code, and so it all lives here. However, if you're clicking play multiplayer, then the game engine here gets instantiated by the server because the server has to have a shared state for all of the players that are connecting to it, right? And so then the game component, its game engine adapter, if you play, if they click multiplayer, will be a multiplayer game engine adapter, and it'll communicate over SignalR up to a game hub, that's a SignalR hub, and then it'll have a multiplayer game engine event handler, which it'll send things down to when events happen, and then those get sent back through here. And so the point here is this same code the exact same code is running in either server-side mode, it's in, running either on the server, or it's running on the client, depending on a runtime attribute, depending on whether someone clicked one button or clicked a different button. How cool is that? Um, I, I mean, I, think just, I just feel like this exposes a whole bunch of opportunities for a whole bunch of different cool things, not just this. But also, yeah, you can put your models and your validation in a shared component, and that's really wonderful, too. 
So Blazor totally gets the win for code sharing. So that was going over 10 different shootout areas and, and now it's like, oh man, which one's better? I don't even know. Let's see if we can recap things and make, it, make a little bit more sense. So who wins? Probably not that guy. But Blazor and uh, when I say Angular, at this point I'm talking about, it could be Vue, it could be React. I just, I personally have the most experience with Angular, so talk about talk about it from that perspective. So if your application is mission critical, if you've got a tight deadline, or if you use JavaScript, <laughs> if you use JavaScript libraries, I think in that case, you really need to go Angular. Conversely, if you've got a hobby project, if you have a hard NuGet dependency, or you have a lot of server-side, client-side code sharing capability, and you know, you and, and I, it's, I don't mean to mention. I mean, you can do code sharing, obviously, in JavaScript if you're using Node. But I just think the code sharing story is wonderful in Blazor. Or you're really future-looking, then Blazor is a clear winner. Regardless of whether or not you're going to go with Blazor on your next project, do keep a close eye on it. It's a really cool technology, and I'm, I'm sure that there's going to be a whole bunch of, of fixes and updates and enhancements coming out to make it even better in the near future, probably by the time you're even watching this. So that is my summary, and thank you for uh, sticking through this, through this long presentation. I hope you learned something. I've got some resources. These slides are available here on this link. This video is, oh, episode 30, I mentioned that. The blog post and all of the code here is open source. And if you feel like playing the game, go to typershark.io. So thanks, and have a wonderful week or month or whatever until I post another episode. Bye-bye.